Uh, for this session, we have a, uh, set up an author interview with uh, Con Crane and uh, John McManus, uh, which will be incredible. Con and John will have a conversation about John's latest book, uh, To the End of the Earth, The U.S. Army and Downfall of Japan, 1945, the third volume in his trilogy of the U.S. Army in the Pacific. Now, as many of you know, Con's long been associated with the museum. He served as a presidential counselor since the inception of that body in 2006. He was a key advisor on our Road to Berlin exhibit, and specifically asked we schedule this session today so that he can watch the Army-Navy game tomorrow. <laughs> yes, some things never change. The, uh, at least he has his priorities straight. But uh, after this, uh, John and Con will have a book signing uh, after this session. But after this, we're going to turn the con over to Con and continue mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always an honor to be here. This is a. <clears throat> I've been amazed at the way this whole organization has grown over the last couple decades, and I'm very proud to have been part of it, and have played a very small role in all the advances it's, it, it has made. Uh, we are really privileged today to have John McManus here as well. Uh, his his books uh, are phenomenal. His his you know as as a as an Army veteran, I think his coverage of the Army especially has been very noteworthy. Uh, I was just actually looking at his list of the 15 books that he's done in the front of his latest, and I one of the one of the, the, the these top <laughs> one of these uh, titles really catches my attention: U.S. Military History for Dummies. That was the book I wrote for myself. So it was <laughs> I mean, that's, you go through all these sophisticated titles, and that one just really strikes me. Uh, but today we're talking about uh, To the End of the Earth, the U.S. Army, the Downfall of Japan, 1945, which is really the third volume in his uh, coverage of the Army in the Pacific. First one was Fire and Fortitude, the U.S. Army, the Pacific War, 1941 to 1943. Second volume, Island Infernos, U.S. Army's Pacific War Odyssey, 1944, and then this last one, which covers the last year of the war. You know, I, I, I'll open with a question for him. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to downgrade what the Marines did in the Pacific, because they did fantastic stuff, and we, we're, we're all familiar with it. But it just seems to me that the Army's role has really been downplayed far too much. Can you talk some about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, and that's what led me to do this series, because, um, you know, I mean, as any World War II scholar, you're looking for something new. Um, and, and as I'm sure many of you know, my area of expertise tends to be uh, American ground combat soldiers, American ground troops of, of one sort or another, or just the American experience in World War II and beyond. Um, and it just, you know, I, I was along with everybody else that uh, I don't think I really quite appreciated the vast size and scale and importance of the Army's role in the Asia-Pacific theater. Uh, and so this became terrifically exciting to me uh, that there would be an absolutely new dimension of this war to explore that I think really has major implications and lessons learned to this day. And, and that was the Army, especially the Army Ground Force and, and Army Service Force role. Uh, because in, in speaking of the Army, I'm not even including the Army Air Forces in, this, in the scope of this. And so that would even add to the vastness of it. But um, so um, it, we start with this factoid that 1.8 million uh, American ground soldiers served in the war against Japan. Uh, that's the third largest military force this country has ever sent overseas to fight a war, uh, behind obviously World Wars I and II in the European theater. And uh, I just think that should be understood and remembered. And of course, uh, as someone who values my life and safety and security. I want to hasten to add I'm not denigrating the Marine Corps in pointing this out. Um, the Marine Corps, obviously, is terrifically important. And its contributions are profound and, and far-reaching. Um, it punches above its, its weight, uh, but there just aren't that many Marines. So there's about 250,000 Marines, roughly. There's six uh, Marine divisions. and. There's the equivalent of about 24 uh, Army divisions that are going to be involved in the war, and, of course, Army service forces, too, which is uh, almost equivalent as well. OK. Yeah, that, I feel better. I feel better. <laughs> uh, how does, OK, again, this is your third volume where you've worked on the, the Army and the downfall of Japan. How does this book 
compare with your previous two in the Army Pacific, uh, Fire and Fortitude and Island Inferno? Right, so there's a chronological scope. Um, Fire and Fortitude covers 1941 to 43, and so that very much takes us into the, uh, the first Philippines campaign. Although one of the things I, I tried to do and started the book uh, was with sort of the Army's uh, experience in the, the Pearl Harbor attacks. Um, that, that, you know, the real target, of course, is the fleet. Everybody else is just kind of in the way, but the army is sort of in the way and, and affected. So you see this kind of uh, sort of provincial, but starting to mobilize army in 1941, becoming by the end of 1943, the beginning of a rather mature professional military force that is really going to carry the load in terms of the ground fighting in the, in the war against Japan. It simply is, and also, by the way, on the aviation engineering side as well, because airfields and air power are so terrifically important. Uh, and that's a major reason why we're taking these various islands throughout the Pacific War. Somebody has to develop that, and of course, the, the naval construction battalions are more famous, the Seabees, but actually the Army's aviation engineers, there's far more of them, and, uh, and they're, they're you know, operating on, on more places. So you see uh, the Army kind of take these punches in the beginning, especially the disaster of the first Philippines campaign, which uh, there have been some good books on it, but I, but I don't know that it has received the historical attention that maybe it deserves. Um, and then, of course, the New Guinea campaign, uh, which also was tremendously overlooked. And then, obviously, Guadalcanal, which, uh, like almost every battle, is not just a marine battle, but also an army battle. Uh, and I think that's the other important thing to remember, is the two ground-oriented services uh, generally fight shoulder to shoulder. And they are designed to be partners. And uh, there is, I would argue, an incredibly deep respect uh, among those who see the sharp end of the war, whether marine or soldier, for one another. Uh, it's really a, the, the, the sort of farther away from combat, the more tension there would tend to be. Um, the second book, Island Infernos, focuses on 1944, which of course is uh, you know, the, the nexus of the American war, uh, the American experience in World War II, where these battles are amping up all over the globe, most famously obviously in Normandy, uh, but at the exact same time, you've got major campaigns going on in, the Sa in uh, you know, Saipan, Guam, uh, Tinian, and then uh, obviously New Guinea is still going on, and you're about to have the Philippines. The second Philippines campaign is really second only to, to Normandy and the Bulge uh, in terms of uh, major American combat power involved and, and the, the protracted nature of it. Um, so this volume, To the End of the Earth, uh, covers 1945, which of course obviously is the capstone to the whole war. So really what that takes us into the, the Luzon element of the, the Philippines campaign, but also uh, meaningfully, uh, General Robert Eichelberger's campaign to, to liberate much of the rest of the archipelago, and then obviously Okinawa. And, and uh, the China-Burma-India theory, the, the, the final completion of the, the so-called Stillwell Road, which also tends to be overlooked. Good, good. Uh, I, I want to focus a little bit on uh, MacArthur's two main army commanders. Talk about MacArthur a little bit, too. My, my own experience, I was, uh, 1983, I was assigned to West Point as a uh, young captain teaching history and, and had a, my uh, one and a half year old son at a football game and he was crying and squabbling and I was walking up and down the, the uh, aisle of section 29 with him and, and there was this very uh, disgruntled looking individual sitting in an old beat up t-shirt and an old hat. <laughs> It was Malcolm Forbes. I didn't, couldn't, it took me a little bit to figure it out. And he said, hey, Captain, you want to talk to Mrs. MacArthur? And I looked at this guy. This guy looked like some drunk out of the, <laughs> off the street. And I, I, I was about to say, you don't, don't, don't give me a, a line like that. And I'd look, and there's Gene Faircloth <laughs> MacArthur sitting next to him. And I've got this crying baby. And my wife is Korean, so my son looked very Korean. And... Uh, and, and I'm trying to with a squabbling baby, and she asked, "Can I hold your son?" So I said, "Boy, I, you know, I was kind of looking to get rid of him any way I could." <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and I handed my son to Mrs. MacArthur, and he immediately became this bright, pleasant little boy <laughs> playing with her stuff. And, and I said, "Ma'am, I, I don't know how you did that." And, and she basically said, "She said, well, you know, we've always had special rapport with people from that part of the world." That's what she said. Because yeah. she recognized the Korean features. And I spent some time talking to her over the next, you know, th that season, because she sat right in front of me at the football games. And boy, she talked about a, a, a great American. I mean, she was just so impressive in, in all respects. And I, I have also been 
I think that her husband has not been treated well by recent history. <laughs> my, my, my own parents were big MacArthur fans from World War II. I think that the pendulum is swung a little bit too far. I think it's time to get some rebalancing of it. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot of MacArthur's, and I've done a lot of study on it as well, a lot of MacArthur's failures came from subordinates who let him down, and he, he tended to trust sometimes too far. I mean, George Stratemeyer in Korea is a good example who promised MacArthur that, yeah, we know there's a lot of Chinese out there, but I can keep them back with my bombers. And that never worked out. But in, in World War II, uh, he's got, you know, Eichelberger and Kruger, these two uh, experienced uh, senior army commanders. Uh, would you compare the two? You write extensively about Eichelberger and Kruger and their work as MacArthur. Just yeah. give a little background on that. Absolutely, they're terrifically important. Um, Walter Kruger is just a fascinating guy. He is a kind of military Horatio Alger story. Um, he's actually born in Germany. And uh, his father was a, uh, an officer in the German army, but his father died when Walter was a child. And so uh, Walter being an only child, uh, his mother took him to uh, the United States. Interestingly enough for me, uh, being from St. Louis, they initially settled in St. Louis. And one of the reasons ostensibly was that his, uh, his uncle either was affiliated with or owned a, a German American brewery, which was a big part of the St. Louis economy at that time. Walter's born in 1881. So in 1898, uh, of course, the Spanish-American War breaks out, and uh, he is drawn to soldiering. So he joins the Army as a 17-year-old private. He retires about half a century later as a four-star general. Um, and I dare say that's probably never going to happen again in the same way. Um, Walter, you know, basically becomes uh, to the, the senior ranks of the NCOs serving in the Philippines in the Philippine-American War in the early 20th century, so he knew the terrain very well. Uh, he gets commissioned from the ranks. He, uh, he, many of his colleagues, of course, were, were West Point trained, or they were college educated, or they'd been through OCS. He had none of the above. Um, and so not only did he have no West Point pedigree, he had no college degree, he had no high school diploma. Um, and he's a four-star general you know, by the end of the war. So, um, and yet, by, by, uh, by the time he's sort of mid-career in the 1920s, he's, um, he's writing these sort of deep dive uh, kind of military intellectual articles that really kind of exceed his, his, his sort of better trained colleagues. Um, so he's very thoughtful, but he also has this kind of connection with the average soldier because he was one. Uh, that he has a sensitivity to it. So in terms of personality, he's a very warm and loving husband and father uh, to, to um, his wife Grace and his three children. Um, but professionally, he has the reputation of being very cold very Prussian, as he was often called, you know, because here he is, foreign-born, and of course, World War II breaks out in Germany, he's not so popular, but, you know, he spoke multiple languages, um, you know, and, and really didn't speak English with, a, with an accent or anything, but he could be gruff, he could be cold, he could be brusque and rude in professional environments, uh, and he had a reputation of being a cautious kind of military commander. Now, one person's cautions is another person's sense, uh, good sense, and so, uh, I think Walter Kruger was, was a fine commander, provided he's in the right kind of mission. Um, now, Eichelberger could not have been more different uh, in terms of his combat philosophy, but they had so much in common in terms of their individual honesty and commitment to professionalism and, and, and whatever else. So Eichelberger is born to a, um, a uh, Civil War veteran on the, on the U.S. side who had uh, become a very successful lawyer and gentleman farmer in Ohio. And so um, Robert Eichelberger is the youngest of uh, five children born into a well-to-do environment. And uh, he's just steeped in Civil War because his mother was on the southern side, was in on the, uh, the siege of Vicksburg. And so, you know, here he is, this young boy, learning all about uh, the Civil War. And um, he's not taken very seriously in his family because He's the youngest, and uh, like many parents, uh, Robert's father felt, oh, my kids are soft, they're never gonna make it today like I did or whatever, and so he's constantly pitting the siblings against one another in what I often call like a reality show. Uh, and so if you're the youngest, you have a tough time competing. So soldiering became his kind of way to distinguish himself, so he always had this kind of need to, to, to achieve things. And, and uh, you know, he, he goes to West Point, he graduates in the class of 1909 with George Patton, and they were, I found that they were friends and corresponded through the war, and I think operationally they were really similar. Um, Eichelberger had seen combat in World War I, but in the, the polar bear expedition in Russia, 
Uh, so very different from his colleagues there. He'd been an intel officer. He'd studied the Japanese. He'd been embedded with a regiment of theirs. Uh, and so he had, uh, by 1945, carved out a record for himself, as I would argue, uh, probably, well, among the finest American ground commanders of the war, and a very much a reputation for being very aggressive and a brilliant practitioner of amphibious operations, I would say. And another individual that you, 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 you spent a chapter on General Albert Wedemeyer in China in this book. How effective was he in this turbulent theater, and what kind of legacy does he leave? Yeah, so Wedemeyer gets there because of what had happened with Joseph Stilwell, that he just simply couldn't get along with Chiang Kai-shek. We heard fascinating uh, background about uh, the Nationalist Chinese and Chiang Kai-shek in the, in the previous session. Um, and Stilwell, of course, famously is somebody who, who is just too brusque, too honest, Vinegar Joe and all this. So he's been sort of ushered out of theater in the fall of 1944 in favor of Wedemeyer, who is who could not be more different personality-wise. Wedemeyer is the classic kind of army insider. Uh, he's always there when there's strategizing, when there's planning. He knows everybody. His networking is incredible. His father-in-law was very, very influential. He was a retired three-star, I think, at this point. Um, Wedemeyer had uh, studied, actually, in Germany in, in the interwar period, in the, the, the equivalent of the, sort of the German war college. Uh, this is a dude who knew war at, a, at, a, at a, like a high strategic policy level. Um, and so when he comes in theater uh, in China, a, he has a different kind of scope of command than Stilwell does. He, he will command just American forces in China and continue as the main uh, chief of staff or advisor to Shang. Uh, he will not control the units in India and Burma, whereas Stilwell had before. But Wedemeyer gets along much better with Chiang Kai-shek. But the, unfortunately, nothing much meaningful changes enough, is the way I put it in the, in the book. Um, that it, the ironic thing is Wedemeyer will think that he's going to have a completely different concept than Stilwell. Stilwell wanted a, a kind of, to stand up a 60 division, uh, really good Chinese nationalist army that could stand up to the Japanese and would have a, uh, a uh, campaign to go and liberate some of the harbors on the, on the coast, which is one of the reasons why China was cut off, why you have the road in the first place. Um, and so Wedemeyer comes in, we're going to have a completely new concept, completely new way of dealing with uh, Shang. What does he end up doing? Coming up with the exact same kind of blueprint for the Chinese army and the same kind of concept, and that's what he's working on when the war ends. Cheapers. Mm. Uh, I've, going through your book, which it, it took me a whole afternoon to read this once I got it, it was really, <laughs> I mean, it was uh, really uh, impressive work. And one of the, I, I found your covers of the destruction of Manila especially tragic. Uh, I know you've got a picture up there you might be yeah, able to I'll run show through. That. Uh, can you talk about that, what happened there, and, and also, how, how did the, if you show that one picture, that'll, how did, how did, the, how did the population recover? From well, the destruction. Zipping there, and of course, by the way, the, you know, you just saw pictures of MacArthur, Kruger, and Eichelberger. You can see Luzon here, and, and uh, the focus of the American invasion, which is an enormous invasion, uh, January 9, 1945. Uh, and of course, a little bit closer look, but uh, and that, that's the fighting within Manila itself. But you can see the destruction. Uh, this is really the, the most, uh, I think that's, the that's what really conveys it like nothing else can. Um, so where does this all come from? Well, um, you know, as we zip through the maps there, you got a sense of the, maybe the size and scale and scope of these operations. They're enormous. Um, and, it, you know, MacArthur definitely wanted to liberate Manila as soon as possible. And I think there's been perhaps a, a misunderstanding or maybe a distortion of his motives that maybe he wanted this for his own aggrandizement or for his birthday in late January or something like that. No. Um, no, there were very clear reasons for wanting Manila because at this point, the, the uh, forces that MacArthur controls are second only to Eisenhower's in terms of the, the commitment of American ground combat power. He's going to have 14 plus divisions, um, and so you need Manila to sustain your armies uh, for the entire liberation of Luzon and elsewhere in the archipelago and moving beyond ultimately closer to Japan. You simply have to have that. Uh, in addition to, of course, the, the sort of propaganda and strategic side of liberating a friendly capital like this that the Americans had sort of helped build, too. And that, of course, obviously is home for, uh, for MacArthur. There are POWs in the Manila area, too, who they, uh, who they want to liberate. So the thing that's really stunning to me and that I, I describe as a sort of precursor to the battle is the, the Japanese commander, General Yamashita or Yamashita, I've heard people who know say it both ways, so forgive me 
if, if you <laughs> disagree with the way I pronounce it. But uh, Yamashita uh, will maintain later, he had no intention of defending Manila. And that is stunning to me for a commander of his quality to not grasp the importance of Manila to his enemies. Uh, as a logistical depot, as a supply harbor, from the symbolic side of it, but also Yamashita's main um, uh, play in this, in this whole campaign is to wear down the Americans, to grind them down, to inflict casualties on them. And of course, he's going to do that, but where else can you do that besides urban combat? Um, so why does it happen that there's a battle fought there when the Japanese commander does not want it? Because he's isolated, he's in the northern part of Luzon, um, there's a leftover naval force, and we all know about the tension between the Imperial Army and Navy. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the forces that are there, it's about 16 to 18,000 Japanese, the majority of them, like dismounted naval personnel, um, they're gonna kind of fight their own battle there, regardless of what Yamashita wants. Uh, it's Rear Admiral Awa Iwabuchi, who really is the key player in this. And so the Americans end up in this protracted two and a half to three division struggle block by block in Manila. And of course, obviously, you see the aftermath. And that only just says, the, you know, part of it. I mean, what this means for the Filipinos is really of much more consequence on many levels because something in over about 100,000 of them are going to lose their lives, partially in the combat, but also due to, a, to an incredible wave of Japanese atrocities that are unleashed when this happens. Not what MacArthur wanted on any level. It was, it was profoundly tragic for him. The, uh, I was also very much drawn to your coverage of Okinawa, uh, another really terrible conflagration. Uh, I was impressed by your coverage of the importance of tanks there. Uh, that with the one, this is the one campaign in the Pacific where it looked like tanks really played an important role. Also, though, you, you really, again, you talk about the tragic fate of the civilians, you know, hundreds of thousands of civilians in Okinawa. So talk about that a little bit, also about how did, how did the Okinawa battle affect perspectives on the coming invasion of Japan? Mm, in many ways, and yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the civilian side too, because I, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, a, a man who was basically a teenager during the war, who later became the, the governor of, of Okinawa, will later say, I think quite profoundly, what exactly were Okinawans supposed to get out of this battle? And I think that expresses it perfectly. They're kind of caught in the middle. Yes, they're part of Japan, they're ethnically similar to the Japanese, but not treated as equals on any level. They're expected by the Japanese to fight and coerced into it, and of course some of them want to fight also, so it's a mixture. So they're caught in the middle of this mess. The Americans are actually reasonably well prepared for dealing with the civil affairs. We tend to think of Pacific Theater Islands as empty, obviously Okinawa is not that. Um, and so you've got some substantial army resources devoted toward that. Uh, so why does it get so bad? Well, because the, the last uh, one-third of the island that has to be taken is the most populous part of it, and many of the population is trapped there because the Japanese would not let them leave, and the Americans are restricting their mobility because of firepower and all the rest of it. Um, so Okinawa turns into this, this terrible, brutal, hilltop-to-hilltop -hilltop struggle, but also kind of urban on some levels with some of the, 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 uh, the larger villages and the, the, the capital and the, the sort of like urban core that, that you see there in the island. Um, it, it is just this kind of incremental combined arms fight. So the tanks, again, this is another thing I tried to kind of take head on in this series, the idea that, that armor is not much involved in the Pacific theater. Um, and that really could, could, couldn't be less true. Um, by the time we're fighting, at, uh, in, in MacArthur's campaign in the Philippines and then now at Okinawa, we have the better part of about, uh, the equivalent of about an armored division deployed in both places. They're just organized differently than they would have been in the European theater where you have the fourth armored division as its own entity. You have these sort of uh, armored task forces and groups. And I point in particular in terms of effectiveness um, to the, uh, the flame tanks that are going to be in play. And that points also to the, uh, the growing ferocity and vulgarity of the war by the time we've reached the spring of 1945. The flame tanks have been in use at Iwo Jima a couple months before, but they're going to be used wider and more extensively at Okinawa. There are about 55 of them, so they would have been parceled out to the attacking rifle companies um, and basically used to, to kind of motivate the Japanese to come out of their caves so that the, the other weapons could be used to just kind of mow them down. Um, but it, it's really quite fascinating because this is just sort of a modern take on one of humanity's oldest weapons, flames. And again, how, how does the, the Okinawa campaign uh, 
you know, they create mm. news perspectives on what the invasion of Japan could be. Um, it, it just creates this sort of general shudder of what the invasion of Japan could mean for ground forces. Uh, because Okinawa had just gotten progressively more terrible, um, it's you know the, the only battle where, where both commanders are killed, uh, General Ushijima, the, the Japanese commander, and of course, uh, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner is, is killed toward the tail end in June 1945. I, I think there's a sense um, that invading the Japanese home islands is going to make Okinawa look like child's play on some levels. And so the, uh, certainly among the ground forces, whether Marine or Army, I mean, they're amping up for this titanic battle and fully expecting they're going to do it. But there's a kind of fatalism there, I think, um, that there's a sense that uh, you know, a lot of us just aren't going to survive, that it'll be amazing if uh, somehow I get through this. Because there was this sense, too, that the Japanese had gone to the, the suicide uh, side of the of weaponry, obviously most famously with kamikazes, but also in ground fighting too. Um, you had Japanese suicide teams on Okinawa that were attacking tanks physically themselves um, with, with you know, all manner of explosives trying to blow themselves up and the tank at the same time. And I think there's a sense that you're going to have this among the civilian populace in Japan and, and whatever else. So no one was particularly eager about going in and fighting. And uh, the interesting thing, too, so the guy who takes over for Buckner is none other than Joe Stilwell, um, who is kind of amping up to, to command troops in the invasion of Japan. He'd always wanted to command American troops in combat, and he sort of had in, in Burma in 1944. But uh, uh, in addition, of course, 6th and 8th Army are supposed to do this, with 8th Army having the main, I would argue, the main um, job of the whole campaign in Operation Coronet near Tokyo uh, you know, in 1946. But also 1st Army was going to be redeployed from Europe. So. Absolute total mess. No one was eager to do this. And in fact, Barton Bernstein has postulated that, that as we, get, we, we start to get signs about the Japanese buildup on Kyushu, where the first invasion is supposed to go in. And he thinks, actually, that the, the, the mass Japanese buildup would eventually force a cancellation of that invasion and just put everything into the big invasion of the, of, of the Kanto plane that was supposed to come later. Do you think that might have happened? They might have postponed? I mean, it's very hard for me to envision that because uh, the Americans through the whole Pacific part of this war have been really worried about their flanks. Uh, and it's, it's a major reason why we don't bypass various islands, why we don't bypass the Philippines in favor of, say, Formosa in Operation Causeway, which is also on the books and Admiral King was arguing for. Because we're worried if we bypass uh, enough, uh, you know, strongly held enough Japanese islands, we're going to end up on the wrong end of aerial attacks with our fleets trying to, to invade wherever we are. And so let's say we continue with Operation Cornet, the, the invasion of Honshu near Tokyo and all that, the capstone of this whole thing. And you've got all these Japanese ensconced at Kyushu, and you have then maybe all waves of kamikazes coming from there in addition to the other islands. Um, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, but I also see his point in the sense that um, when you're looking at making an invasion, and it's becoming pretty clear by the late summer 1945 that the, the Japanese ground presence on Kyushu is going to be larger than 6th Army. And Kruger was going to have probably about a dozen divisions or something like that in 6th Army, so not a small force. And you were still going to be outnumbered. Now, qualitatively, the American forces are going to be better and better supported in firepower. But still, the terrain would have been extremely difficult. Um, and so. I, I don't think there was really a good answer either way. The, the other thing that's sort of mind-blowing um, is that the Americans are also concerned that they could succeed in these invasions of Kyushu and Honshu and grab the home islands, but that the Japanese would continue to resist on the Asian mainland in Manchuria and the rest of China. And that's partially why the Roosevelt administration had been so eager to get the Soviets in the war eventually to, to mm. maybe forestall that possibility. Um, yeah, there, there was. Just, I think maybe the larger theme is just just wasn't going to be a good ending to this, no matter what. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, they, they had plans to use three atomic bombs on each invasion beach at Kyushu. There would have been nine, and then the, the, the orders to the landing forces is wait an hour before you walk through the zone mm -hmm. where the bombs. I mean, <laughs> I mean, think of that. You know, I mean, uh, it, yeah. <laughs> who knows the damage we would have done to ourselves? Jeepers. Mm. Uh, so that, with all that. I, I, I like the section where you write about the, the reaction of the soldiers to this, to this. All of a sudden, we have peace in August 19. How, how did the soldiers react to this sudden appearance of peace? In yeah, August? so you know, yeah, you have this. All of a sudden, you get the the wonderful announcement August 14th and 15th, uh, 1945. And uh, you know, of course, some people reacted with great joy, and they tended to be the people who were newer in theater or maybe hadn't seen quite as much combat. 
Um, there were a lot of people who, who'd spent a long time slogging through the, the uh, Pacific who hadn't necessarily seen a lot of action. They had done the dirty, difficult logistical side of the war. I think there's a little more elation on, on their side. Uh, for those who had seen a lot of combat, the tendency is a uh, kind of relief uh, and a kind of reflection on, on how many friends you had left behind. I mean, there were units like the 7th Infantry Division, for instance, that had uh, done just an incredible amount of fighting in four campaigns in this war. And so you can imagine if you had survived to the end, it's really not all that different than if you're in the 3rd ID in the, in the uh, European theater or whatever. You've been through a lot at that point. But, uh, but there's also, you know, certainly a fair amount of what we would think of as indiscipline, uh, you know, uh, a lot of firing of weaponry and all that kind of stuff, which is dangerous, um, you know, there, but there's a lot of partying and whooping it up. I also noticed, too, in, in my research that on, on the medical side of the house, there wasn't as much celebrating because they still had so much to do and, uh, and so many of them had, had seen so much tragedy in this war. So um, VJ Day, I think, is a bigger deal back home in terms of partying than it is for the, uh, the forward deployed military folks, I, I guess I would argue. Wow, that's yeah. it's interesting. Okay, the, the last question before we give open it to the audience. Uh, I was particularly affected by your coverage of the many problems faced by Jonathan Wainwright. You know, mm -hmm. Talk about somebody who's been a, kind of a figure in all your, all your books in the, in the zone, and upon a, especially upon his return home. Could you talk about his, you know, his return and then his, his kind of his life after this long captivity? He'd been in you know, since 19, early 42. Yeah, so Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright was the highest ranking American POW in, the, in this war. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, he succeeds MacArthur when MacArthur leaves the Philippines in 1942. He's captured then in May 1942 at Corregidor. And so, you know, from that day forward, he has the responsibility for all uh, American POWs in this war as the, the commander. And he's often not treated with much deference and respect for, by the Japanese. He's subjected to beatings. Uh, what we would think of certainly as torture. He's not in particularly good physical condition anyway, and his physical condition only worsens in the course of the war. For a long period of his captivity, and we see this, I hope, maybe throughout the, the three books, you see this whole story unfolding, he's convinced that he is going to be reviled if he ever is liberated. He's going to be court-martialed um, and thought of as, as really just a, a, you know, a, a complete coward on some levels. Um, he, he's getting an inkling by you know, the, the spring to summer 1944 that that's not the case in this country because uh, smuggled into him is a, uh, uh, I, don't remember, I don't remember if it was Time, it's one of the, the prominent magazines in which he's on the cover and portrayed as a hero. So I think he has an inkling that maybe this is gonna go all right for him, although he's going through this kind of mental torture. So where is he at the end of the war? He's in, um, in, in uh, China. And uh, so his whole liberation is this odyssey, too, and I won't bore you with all the details of that. But the bottom line is, uh, even after you know, VJ, and what, VJ Day and whatnot, it takes the better part of almost you know, two to three weeks for General Wainwright to be extracted and, and really protected and eventually get back to, to Allied control. So he's reunited with MacArthur in this very incredible moment when MacArthur is uh, heading up the occupation forces initially on the eve of the, the surrender ceremony aboard the USS Missouri, and there's a famous picture, you know, where they're hugging and whatnot, and it's, it's, it's all, it, there's so much behind that picture. Um, because these two guys had known each other a long time, uh, since West Point, uh, you know, and they had served together, and MacArthur had really done Wainwright dirty on, on some levels in trying to prevent him from getting a Medal of Honor uh, because he felt that, that Wainwright had kind of betrayed him and surrendering and all this kind of stuff. But over time, MacArthur got over that and, and Wainwright was about to be conferred with the Medal of Honor once he's liberated and is really going to be celebrated as kind of the number one American hero once he comes home. There's a major parade for him in uh, Washington, D.C. He's reunited with his wife, Adele, who had gone through incredible mental hell. Not, think about this, not just worrying about her husband during the war, but having to have that face of the commander's wife through the whole war, everything that meant, whether she was ready for that or not. Um, and so he's reunited with her, and uh, then you know there's another parade and all this, and everybody wants a piece of Wainwright. So one of the things, one of the things I, I end the book here is, um, is with 
uh, really kind of post-war discussions of some of the key people we've talked about in this war, whether it's MacArthur, Wainwright, Eichelberger, whoever. Um, and it, um, Wainwright is this sort of tragic story on some levels because it, it's, you know, the, the term too much of a good thing. Um, as one of his West Point classmates put it, you know, Wainwright was always trapped in his hero's cage. And, mm. and it was hard to handle that. And he'd always been a heavy drinker. And so everybody now wanted to drink and party with him and wanted a piece of him and wanted to hang out with him and wanted to be known as seen with him. And, and, and so then this kind of indulges that sort of party side and the, the drinking got worse. Uh, Adele has this, this sort of complete kind of emotional collapse in which she has to be institutionalized. Um, Wainwright dies 10 years to the day, exactly 10 years to the day after the surrender ceremony aboard the USS Missouri. And even during his, his dying uh, hours, there were people lined up uh, in the corridors of the hospital uh, wanting to kind of be hangers on and be part of this. So even then, he couldn't quite get away from it. And so um, he's really a, quite of a, a tragic figure, even though he gets his due and then some. Uh, and I think in that sense, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, you know it's, it's really kind of a sad story, I think. Well, no, that, I, that was particularly poignant and tragic. Um, but, the, but there's all kinds of, I highly recommend this book, there's all kinds of great stories throughout this book. I think at this time, we'll, we'll turn it over to the, got about 20 minutes left in our session, we'll turn it over to the audience. If, from those of you that we, we can't see <laughs> out there in the Great, well, crowd. thank you to Khan and John, wonderful discussion. We'll do in the center aisle, gentlemen. Uh, just look in the general direction. You're not going to see them regardless. If you want to stand, sir. John, you just described Wainwright as being uh, tragic. Um, Walter Kruger in his personal life, post-World War II, was he not also? He really was, yeah. So Walter Kruger, of course, um, is in command at the end of the war. He's initially in on the occupation of Japan as a commander of Sixth Army. He decides to retire in early 1946. And so um, he and his wife, Grace, had decided to retire in the San Antonio area, which is one of the reasons why initially um, when uh, Kruger is standing up an army in 1943, it's called the Alamo Force. And later on, his special operators are known as the Alamo Scouts. It was a nod to the fact that the general was making a home in San Antonio. So um, at this point, things kind of go sideways for him uh, after his well-deserved retirement. He has serious financial troubles. Um, the, the tax rates for general officers during World War II were higher than they were for most other military personnel at lower ranks. And, and uh, Kruger had not managed his finance well, so, so he had this tax bill that in tandem with buying a retirement home in San Antonio uh, really led to serious financial pressure. Um, that, that was, as he said, like a sword of Damocles over my head. So he was kind of dependent upon the, the charity of friends and whatnot. It was very awkward for a retired four-star to be in that position. In addition, now there were problems cropping up among his kids. Um, one of his sons uh, was uh, uh, discharged from the Army under adverse circumstances because of trouble with alcohol uh, and some incidents that, that uh, eventuated from that. But really, more horrifyingly, his daughter, uh, who was also married to a soldier, um, ends up um, uh, murdering him one night, in, uh, stabbing him to death one night in, uh, in Japan during the, the Korean War. So this, uh, he, the, her husband was a uh, colonel on the, on the staff at, uh, at the headquarters in Tokyo. Uh, she stabs him to death. And uh, the, she's weirdly then tried in a military court and convicted of murder. Um, and she goes to prison. You can imagine the anguish for, for Kruger and his wife over this. But eventually, they took her case all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing quite cogently that she's a civilian. Why was she tried as military? And she's released on that basis. And she has something of a better life after that. Well, to this point, too, that Grace's um, health really started to go downhill. Uh, and this was devastating for Walter Kruger. And then uh, she dies, and he makes all these statements you know, to friends about how he would like to join her soon. So he's, he's really depressed. He writes a memoir uh, called From Down Under to Nippon. And uh, it's, it's of use to, to like, you know, nerds like Khan and me in a way, you know, to where it's like, okay, you know, we can document all this, but, but I don't recommend reading that book because it's so darn boring. It's just, 
it's this recapitulation of Sixth Army reports and all this stuff. And it interspersed in there here and there is a little bit of human flavor, but it was like Kruger himself, not really showing you his full humanity at times. Um, so he hated working on it, absolutely hated it, it became this drudgerous task. And so by the time General Kruger dies in, uh, I think it's 1967, uh, he, was, he was blind, he was in terrible health, he was terribly depressed. He has this, he has really, unfortunately, a very sad end. Yeah, I'll just say one thing on Kruger is being at the Army War College now is, is a lot of, he was on the staff of the Army War College before the war, and he's got some really impressive stuff on the files there. He did some great work on a lot of things before the war. Definitely a, a brilliant man in that respect. Really thoughtful, yep. Okay. Gentlemen, we'll stay right in this row to your left a little. <laughs> uh, my, quest Oops. my question is, why after the uh, bloodbath on Saipan was the Army so surprised or whatever about the level of resistance on Okinawa? Mm. <clears throat> I don't know that anybody was particularly surprised by the level of resistance on Okinawa. I think what, what surprised... Um, the, the, the commanders at the time, if we could think of it as such, is how it all unfolded and what the terrain was like. I don't know that, the, and this is, this is a pattern in the Pacific War quite often where we don't really have a lot of good um, human intel or on the ground intel or a lot of good topographical studies of terrain or whatever that sometimes we don't quite grasp um, you know, like the caves at Peleliu or the caves on Okinawa, like what that's going to mean for the fighting there. I think, uh, I think very few people who went ashore at Okinawa expected it to be a walkover, and I think they were shocked initially when Japanese resistance, when there's hardly any to the initial invasion, American invasion. And that, that floors me too, because uh, I, I think to myself, well, what were you expecting? I mean, it, look at all you had to do, really, was look at the, the pattern of what had happened in previous invasions on the run-up to that, and that had been the pattern, that they weren't going to necessarily resist you at the waterline, like at Luzon, but that they were really going to resist inland. Um, the, 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 you mentioned Saipan. Um, I, I think Saipan certainly sets the tone that we had already seen before and we're going to see after, that when we encounter the Japanese wherever they are, they're going to generally fight to the death if they can, and so it's going to, any battle that happens in the Pacific is going to be kind of an extermination sort of battle. What I compare it to through this whole series is, um, you know, if you can imagine like a shattered mirror. Uh, you, you know, you pick up the main shards and whatnot, but there's all, a lot of times these little jagged shards out there hiding in your carpet. Um, it's the same kind of thing with a lot of these Pacific theater battles that you've defeated the main Japanese forces or whatever, you've secured what you need to, but there's still danger lurking out there. Uh, so Okinawa, I don't know that it was going to be any different. Just a, 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 a spin-off on that question, though. You, should they have done another invasion? You talk about the, they had that plans that maybe... Oh, at Okinawa, yeah. Yeah, Okinawa. yeah, this is a controversy to this day. Whether, of course, you have the initial invasion on April 1st, 1945. Whether Buckner should have authorized a subsequent outflanking invasion on the southern, like the southeastern coast, that could have put pressure on the Japanese and dispersed some of the, their defenses along the Shuri line and whatnot. Um, I come down on the side that, that he probably should have done that. And, and the reason I think that is, look at, let's look at what happened at Leyte a few months before uh, when, when General Kruger launches uh, a, an outflank amphibious invasion at Ormoc. The 77th Infantry Division goes in there and that really kind of unlocks the key of Japanese defenses uh, along the Cordillera Range on, on Leyte. I think something of the same possibility could have been in play at Okinawa, even with the same division, the 77th. The, the commander, General Andrew A.D. Bruce, wanted to do this. And where there's mythology, I would argue, to this day around that, is the idea that, well, the Marines were arguing for this, and they knew amphibious warfare better, and they were more flexible in the Army, and its stodgy old ways said, nope, 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 we're not doing that. Actually, that's absolute nonsense. Um, the Marines did want to do this, and so did most of Buckner's Army commanders, including Bruce. Um, so the, the, the buck stopped with Buckner in a way that he, he doesn't quite, I would argue, grasp the possibilities in this because he sees the battle he's fighting as akin to Anzio. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the battle he's fighting. The Germans at Anzio have a whole continent to back them up to, to send in reinforcements. The Japanese don't have that. So um, the logisticians, if you're worried about your supply situation or whatever, the logisticians have already told you we can get enough shore that you can, you can do damage to the Japanese. So 
Um, I understand why Buckner made the decision he did, but I, I think it maybe stemmed from his inexperience in amphibious operations that maybe he would add a learning curve, and I think he probably should have done it only in my opinion. John, I know our Vice President of Education and Access, Pete Crane, is listening in the room next door, and he greatly appreciates you mentioning logisticians. Next, I knew, I knew Pete would love that. But next question is all the way to your left, books. about halfway back with <laughs> Connie, please. I was wondering if you could speak to the relationship between Eichelberger and MacArthur. My understanding is that Eichelberger had some successes, got some good press out of it. MacArthur got in a snit about that and kind of worked to sabotage his career. Yeah, so the, the, these two, uh, especially by 1945, Eichelberger and MacArthur, have had a long road together. Uh, they've known each other for many years. Eichelberger had once worked for MacArthur when MacArthur was Army Chief of Staff in the 1930s. Um, they'd gotten on pretty well. They really had, and they, they kind of always will on a surface level. But, uh, of course, famously, MacArthur brings in um, uh, Eichelberger to salvage the, the situation of Buna in New Guinea in uh, November 1942, and he tells him, of course, uh, menacingly, take Boona Bob or don't come back alive. So I always say, imagine if your boss told you that, you know, <laughs> do this job or don't come back alive, you know? And so, I mean, and Eichelberger being Eichelberger, I mean, this is his kind of uh, moment to shine as he sees it. He's extraordinarily courageous. He's such a lead from the front general. And like those who we remember meaningfully and successfully, he was lucky too, and that he didn't get killed like that, you know? Um, so he had really, almost single-handedly turned around that situation at Buna in a way that I think is very important to study to this day. And if there's one thing Eichelberger really wants out of this, it's, you know, sort of immortality, is to be known, uh, and to be known eventually like his classmate, George Patton. And if there's one thing MacArthur's gonna deny him, it's just that. Why? Because there's only enough room for MacArthur in the sort of hero worshiping. So Mac MacArthur kind of sabotages him there. He, behind the scenes, puts the scotch on a potential Medal of Honor that Eichelberger would have gotten, and I think would have deserved, personally. Um, he sidetracks him for about a year or so, uh, but MacArthur isn't dumb, either, and he understands that this is a really good, successful commander and someone he can get along with well. Uh, now that he's learned his lesson, never to upstage MacArthur. Um, it, although, by the way, MacArthur gave him authorization to talk to the press, and, and, and then, I guess, thought better of it, or whatever. It's so weird. But, um, so, <laughs> so Eichelberger ends up as, as sort of MacArthur's fireman, in a way, to, to put out, you know, crises, and, and, and to, you know, from Buna to Biak uh, to the Philippines or wherever it would be. So, the, the other thing, too, I should point out is, um, it's very possible that MacArthur prevented Eichelberger from getting a major command in the Normandy invasion. And uh, so Eichelberger, once he figured all this out, um, he really did come to resent MacArthur uh, privately throughout the rest of his life. Never talked about it publicly, but boy, when you look at his, his dictations and his personal writings and all that, I mean, it's like, you know, ripping him uh, <laughs> to, to shreds. And, uh, Eichelberger did not get along well with Kruger. Eichelberger got along with like everybody he ever met in his life, except Kruger he thought was so insufferably rude that he just could not wrap his mind around it. And so his later, latter year dictations and writings are, are, are full of uh, some recriminations, shall we say. Thank you. Gentlemen, all the way in the back to your right, please. Uh, two questions. One, in, at Peleliu, they wanted to bypass Peleliu, but MacArthur said no, and uh, uh, said no that they had to oh. take Peleliu to protect his yeah. flank. I think I'm getting this right. And the other one was the Army commander overruled the Marine and said, you need reinforcements on Peleliu. And the other one, I'm surprised no one has mentioned this, was the riff on Saipan, where General Smith from the Marines fired General Smith from the Army. And was that warranted? A lot to unpack and to, to correct on the historical record there. Um, so Peleliu, uh, it is, is certainly on the books as an operation that both MacArthur and Nimitz are on board with for that reason that they thought that they were going to need to protect MacArthur's flank when he moves on to the Philippines. But the actual authorization for the operation happens uh, as a result of Nimitz's uh, decision, not MacArthur's. MacArthur was aboard ship on the way to the, to the invasion of Moratai at the time and thus sort of out of communication. 
Nimitz, um, for reasons that he never really quite explains, that I blame on Craig Simons as his biographer, I'll just say that, but uh, it's, it's all his fault. But uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, for, for reasons Nimitz really never quite explained, um, he decides to go ahead with the, the invasion, which obviously I think you know, many of us would feel was not the right call. Um, my opinion, maybe he felt that he owed that to MacArthur, that MacArthur would still want the operation to go forward. We just don't know. Um, as for what happens once they're, they're on Peleliu, um, you end up with a really bad situation, I, I would argue, because of the, the um, primarily because of the, the first Marine Division commander, William Ruperitus, um, who is really quite a courageous man on many levels, but has this idea that it needs to be his division that takes Peleliu and he doesn't want any Army help. It's a, it's a core level operation. So you have the 1st Marine Division going in at Peleliu, and then you have the Army's 81st Infantry Division that is slet, slated to either go ashore and help the Marines at Peleliu or, or, and or uh, assault Angar, a little island just like three miles away. So Ruperis thinks the Marines can take the island in three to four days. He's terribly, tragically wrong about that. And he, he eventually has to be overruled in this after he's really kind of destroyed the better part of his incredible division, one of the finest divisions on the planet at that point. Um, he's overruled not by an army commander, but by Roy Geiger, the Marine Corps commander, who comes in and says, no, I'm sending in a, a regiment from the 81st Division, and then I'm sending in another one for you. Um, the whole Saipan Smith versus Smith thing, we could have a whole session, maybe a whole conference on that. I have much to say on that, but I, I, I want to leave that for other questions unless we really want to delve into that, because that is a, that's a big one to unpack. Yes, next, it is. next one's going to be to your left with Connie in the middle of the row. Hey, how's it going? Um, my question is on the replacement system. Mm -hmm. So most of the battles are early in the Pacific. They have their intense battle. The division is able to go rest, recuperate. And you also get the chance of having the veterans train the new guys coming in. I'm like European theater where I don't want to know who this guy is. I don't care about him. Poor guy never gets the experience of a veteran. By the time you get to the Philippines, you're actually having longer ground campaigns like Europe. How's the system working there? I'm, I'm, I've just never read about it. It was always about, oh, we can bring in the new kids, train them, and then we go to war. Yeah, it's basically the replacement system is the same in the, in the Pacific theater as it is in Europe. And you're right, sometimes you have the luxury of being out of combat training for the next invasion, and so that, that's a good way to join as a replacement. Uh, but really, every bit as commonly as the Pacific theater unfolds, especially for the Army, it's more akin to Europe, where you know, we're, uh, we're on the lines in New Guinea for you know, six weeks, eight weeks, two months at a time, or something like that, and new guys are cycling in, or we're on Leyte or on Luzon, or we're on um, Mindanao, or, or you know, Okinawa, wherever it would be, it's the same kind of dynamic. Um, and the interesting thing, too, about that whole thing, um, replacements are actually better welcome than I think we, we, we remember in the, in the popular memory, uh, in part because they were so badly needed. And it didn't mean they were always trusted or you know, whatever, but you just needed them because the casualty rates were so high in the, especially the ground combat units. So like a, uh, an army survey in the uh, European theater showed that about two thirds of those who they surveyed had not come overseas with their original division, which meant they joined as replacements. So it was just so, so common, and I don't know that it'd be really any different if uh, we're part of, say, the 24th Infantry Division in the Philippines or whatever, uh, we're suffering similar casualties and the, and the same kind of dynamic just, just goes on. Next question, we're going to stay in the back to your right, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, you mentioned flame tanks on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. I'm wondering how much return of experience is the U.S. Army in the Pacific getting from Europe on that subject and others? Um, thinking about Hobbit's Funnies, Churchill Crocodiles, that sort of thing. Are they sort of looking at what happened in Europe? Uh, somewhat. So the, the uh, Army Ground Forces, you know, have this constant kind of reflection and examination. They've, uh, General Marshall has overseen uh, not just, you know, like Infantry Journal and, and you know, uh, Artillery Journal and all this stuff, but also special pamphlets that would be distributed to soldiers and whatnot. And especially, you know, if you're a battalion commander or whatever, then you're, you're, all, you're definitely training your eyeballs on that. But I don't necessarily see, like, a direct link 
between the way flame tanks would be used, uh, especially by the British, in the European theater, and what you end up seeing at Okinawa. They're, they're, they're operating a little bit independently, although maybe anecdotally and informally, commanders might have been aware of what was going on in Europe. But I don't know that we could point to, to like direct coordination, at least that I, that I know of. Next question, we're gonna to stay to your right towards the back, please. After the uh, radio notifications about attacks on Pearl Harbor and then later the destruction of the Army Air Force bases in the Philippines, why wasn't MacArthur sacked like Kimmel and Short? Mm -hmm. Is it because he was engaged in battle or did he have friends in high places? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair question, and, I, and, and it's, it's one I've been asked a number of times, and I, I totally get it, uh, because the, the aerial disaster that MacArthur suffers in the, in the wake of the onset of hostilities in December 1941 is almost equivalent to Pearl Harbor on some levels, and it certainly alters the Philippines campaign, you know, almost irretrievably in Japan's favor, because they are more or less going to control the air and thus the sea. Um, but it's a different animal in a sense that it, there certainly isn't as much media coverage, it's true. It's happening farther away. Um, it's not quite like losing half of your capital ships uh, that you've got in the harbor that the American public have, have paid so much for over the course of decades. So it's a little different than the naval quotient on that sense. You've lost some planes that you can definitely replace industrially. Um, the, the other thing that I think is important to remember is that MacArthur is going to, pretty quickly after the onset of hostilities, um, cultivate a pretty strong cult of personality. He understands how to sell himself and uh, how to sell what he's doing in the Philippines as sort of heroic to the American public. But he's not like any old commander, uh, like, like say husband Kimmel would be or something, in this sense. He'd been the Army Chief of Staff. Um, he has certainly connections at high levels. He understands how that works. He's already, um, known very well in War Department circles and administration circles, and he has a kind of political element to him and himself through his whole career. You know, as I chronicle in, in uh, Fire and Fortitude and later, he basically runs for president, you know, sub Rosa as a military commander in 1943 and 44, and so he has a strong base of support in the Republican Party. Uh, so Roosevelt would have to proceed very warily to sack him, and then also logistically, how would you get him out of there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then awkwardly, who would succeed him? You know, and, and so, yeah. But it, it's a totally fair question. I, I get where you're coming from. But again, uh, talking to people from that generation, the, the veneration which MacArthur is held by a lot of the public also is another factor they don't have with somebody yeah. like Kimmel or Short. Ladies and gentlemen, Con Crane and John McManus.